All right. Well, Amazon says we are live, and so that's good enough for me. Uh, we are here with Mary Spath. We are live on Amazon. There's a couple other channels that we're on. If you are watching on another channel, I encourage you to go to Amazon.com slash live, and you will find me, D. Scott, there with our guest, Mary Spath. And uh, as you can see, she's got this great resume. Uh, I pulled out some highlights. You can find her on the Internet Movie Database, imdb.com, as well as Wikipedia and a number of other places. She's done some tremendous things. Producer for 2020, White House Fellows Program, Director of Public Affairs for the Federal Trade Commission, White House Director of Media Relations, actor, author, entrepreneur. And uh, with that, let's bring Mary on to the screen. So, hey, Mary, so welcome. Thank you. What a pleasure to be here. <laughs> so tell us where in the world you are dialing in from and broadcasting us with, with us here on Amazon. Well, I'm calling in from Dallas, Texas, where I live. Texas has been very good to me. Uh, Big D has been a great place to live, and mercifully, it's above freezing. <laughs> yeah, I was talking to some folks uh, last week, and uh, single digits, minus temperatures. Yeah, I got it in single digits, which is... It's not unheard of, but it's not usual for Dallas. And people walk around, you know, wondering what's happened. The uh, the Arctic, we just like the Arctic air to stay in the Arctic. Yeah. Well, give us a little background. I threw up a few things there. And we do have uh, uh, highlighted in the carousel is uh, this book, which is a, a a recent release from you, Baby Bear Comes Back. And with all of the things you've done, writing a children's book just seems like a great way to go. But uh, let's get a little background on, on who you are and how you came to go through all these different great experiences and write a children's book as well and a coloring book, which is also in the carousel. Well, I, I always like to say, say, Scott, my dad, who's a doctor, likes to say it's better to be lucky than smart, but the real trick is knowing the difference. And I have been exceptionally lucky and exceptionally blessed. I've had incredible numbers of opportunities that people created for me without really my deserving or doing anything for them. So at any stage of my life, I've been doing something interesting. There's always been something where I could be do something that was interesting and where I felt I could make a contribution and be productive. And that's really all I wanted to be is to do something which would either help people or entertain people or both. I love it. And so one of the things that, that came up that was really unusual, and uh, you were in a movie with one of my favorite uh, comedic actors, uh, Peter Sellers. And uh, let me just throw this up so uh, people can actually, you can actually uh, get the DVD right here uh, hmm. on, uh, on Amazon, The World of Henry Orient. And uh, so how did you happen to get into a movie and what was that when did that happen and oh, how that was the mid 1960s you're so kind to bring that up scott <clears throat> the world of henry orient uh, written by nora johnson uh the famous screenwriter not only johnson's daughter <clears throat> is about uh, a guy who's a, played by peter sellos who is a well there's just no way to put this he is a womanizing pianist <laughs> who lives in new york and plays avant-garde music and these two little girls who are young teenagers myself and Tippy Walker. <clears throat> it's a coming of age story. And we develop a crush on him and we follow him all around New York, making his life generally miserable and interfering, interfering too frequently in his amorous attempts. <clears throat> George Roy Hill directed it. And I got into it because he wanted two girls who weren't professional actresses. So they sent casting directors to schools all over the country. And I was in the eighth grade at Germantown Friends School in Philadelphia. And we had just done a performance of Alice in Wonderland and no, I was not Alice, but I did have two parts. I was Tweedledee and Tweedledee and Tweedledum, and I was the White Knight with a marvelous costume of white shirt cardboard. <clears throat> and it was a Quaker school, and our dramatics teacher didn't want to play favorites, so she basically sent in the whole drama class. So we all went, we trooped up for these interviews, and to everybody's astonishment, the only one they were interested in was me. And I ended up with the part. Peter Sellers was wonderful. If you watch the movie, and I encourage people to watch, I mean, it is a classic, wonderful movie. If you listen carefully, because his accent, he, he grew up in, in apparently in Brooklyn, but he pretends to be this European 
master. And his accent migrates from French to Bulgarian to Italian. And then when he thinks nobody's listening, he's back to Brooklyn again. It is <laughs> hilarious. <laughs> and we filmed for five months and Tippy and I got to sit at his feet. And as you know, um, there's not a lot to do when you're filming between takes. And so he would basically take Inspector Clouseau and do all these different things for us. He was wonderful. Angela Lansbury was also in it, and I remained friendly with her until she died last fall. So uh, it's got a great cast. Tom Bosley was in it, Peter Duchin. And I promise your viewers and your listeners that they will love it. Well, we've got this highlighted in the carousel. You can, I'll just tell people, you can just click add to cart. This is a great thing about Amazon. You can just uh, click and uh, add this to cart and um, buy the movie and Golden Globe nominee. So uh, it's got some critical acclaim. Peter Sellers is just, uh, I loved his acting. Uh, he had so many movies where he played multiple parts. And so and I like, can see that with his accents, being able to yeah, do that. He, he, with Dr. Strange, yes. But he was also, he was a very shy person. All the things that your viewers and listeners have read about him are probably true. Mm. So Tippy and I, you know, I was 14, Tippy was 16. We were just there in awe of him. So we made a great audience for him. So you did that when you were uh, in eighth grade, you said? Eighth, ninth grade, that's right. A long time yeah. ago. And then you, uh, in the green room beforehand, you mentioned uh, Columbia. So you went to school at Columbia. I went to business school at Columbia. Uh, after I graduated from, uh, from high school, I did a variety of different things. I bounced all around as a writer. But I also, <clears throat> wait for it, Scott, I was one of the first people to experiment in this new medium called cable television. <laughs> <laughs> in the mid-1970s, this was hot stuff. Mm -hmm. And the New York Times had just started the weekend section. Warner had just uh, uh, electrified all five bureaus, and so I mean all five boroughs in New York City. So they were desperate for programming. And for the grand sum of $25 a half hour, you could have your own show. <laughs> so I recruited about 20 volunteers to look mm -hmm. for restaurants, street fairs, bargains, off, 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 off Broadway plays. We put together something called Manhattan Weekend. We were the first cable production to be supported by general advertising dollars. Bankers Trust was advertising something called the Miss a Month Loan. And their advertising agency said, don't bother with this. Cable's a fad. Nobody's going to do anything. But they decided to take a flyer. So that's one of our claims to fame. We were first to do that. And I still remember all the, uh, the language from the Miss a Month Loans. And then... Um, Gee, this part of the story is a little difficult. <clears throat> we had a flood in our studio. So but we were getting so much critical response that we moved to a new studio. Unfortunately, our revenue stayed the same and our costs doubled. Oh. And that sent me back to Columbia Business School. And when I was there, everybody got together at the beginning of the semester in, the, in your class by alphabet. And you got up and said who you were. And people are getting up saying, you know, I'm Phil Giaquinto. I'm here from Chase to get an MBA. So we get back to the S's and I stand up and I say, I'm Mary Spaeth and I'm here because we went through two years of capital in 13 weeks. And everybody laughed and I sat down and we discovered that I, we had made every mistake that a small business makes and some of them we'd made two and three times. But Columbia taught me a lot. Without Columbia, I'd be a much different person. So it was really a tremendous experience. Now, mm -hmm. I should tell your listeners that my beloved father, who's an ophthalmologist, likes to say that I'm living proof that Columbia Business School graduates anybody <laughs> such such a great uh quote i love that in my case true <laughs> so uh cable television so that's a, that's new i didn't know that you did that so you were uh, a, f a pioneer there and then um i also invented the internet invented the internet that's a good thing because i use it every day yeah Thank not you. al gore it was me <laughs> And uh, speaking of Al Gore, he was in the White House. You were in the White House. I was. <clears throat> and you, you were a White House fellow and uh, okay. director okay. of communications. It will. Uh, the fellows program was started under Lyndon Johnson, and its goal is to bring people into Washington, initially early in their career, but now at any point you spend a year, usually with a cabinet officer. You travel for the president. 
It is one of the greatest experiences in the world, and I encourage again any of your listeners look it up on the uh, on the website White House Fellows. The application alone is an education, and it is. They generally take between ten and fifteen fellows a year. I was assigned to William Webster, the director of the FBI, and I was the first fellow to go there, and the only non-lawyer on his executive staff. Wow. Um, it was an extraordinary experience. Then I went from that there to the Federal Trade Commission, and then from there I did go to the White House as the director of media for President Reagan. That's amazing. Let me just, uh, I'm going to throw this up. Uh, Gail Robertson, she says, hello. And, and you were talking about my title says uh, uh, motivational listener. Uh, you'll love Gail's too. Chief curiosity. I love it. I'm stealing it. <laughs> Absolutely. Maybe, if she's, maybe if she's the chief curiosity officer, I could be a deputy chief. I like that. Deputy chief. There we go. That is, uh, you know, they said that uh, in uh is a is an undergraduate it's called plagiarism as a graduate student it's called research and in business we call it leveraging so you're not stealing oh, I love Gee, that yeah we're, we're we're leveraging that so so t what's it like to be in the white house i mean we hmm. we see movies but uh most of us have at the best i you know stood at the at the fence and looked across the grass at at this impressive building but what's it like to be on the inside well, when I was there, Jim Baker was the chief of staff, and he was the best chief of staff that any White House has ever had. <clears throat> of course, President Reagan was the was president. Uh, Mr. Bush, George Herbert Walker Bush, was the vice president. Mm -hmm. And I was privileged to work a tremendous amount with Mr. Bush as vice president. And when you're in the White House, I, I, although I must tell you, Scott, I can only imagine what it's like today, because when I was there, <clears throat> the, I should tell people, tell people, the media office is not the press office, which deals with the White House press corps. The media office is everybody else, local press, trade press, social media, but it doesn't report to the press office. It reports to the chief of staff or the big press office, which squish it. Um, and, and its job is basically to get the news of what's going on in the White House, to make it accessible to everybody outside of the Washington press corps. Um, and it was a wonderful experience when I was there. The reason that I jokingly say I started the internet is because when I was at the Federal Trade Commission, where one of, I was in charge of a number of different initiatives, um, I, we had no money. So I started looking around to see what other people in Washington were doing. And I've had all places, agriculture, they were the first department to sign up with ITT dial I don't know if some of you may remember, you had these cups and you put the phone in and it went, oh, yeah. Yeah. and mm -hmm. you dialed in. Um, I, people don't even know what to dial, so it is anyway. <laughs> That's right. And up came agriculture news. And I thought, the future. So when I got over to the White House, Mr. Baker said, what do you want? I said, I want that. And the next day, the ITT people were in my office saying, can we help you, Ms. Smith? I said, I want that. So we designed something that's called the White House News Service. And all you needed was a phone and a modem and a monitor. And you dialed in and up came White House News. Mm. And everything that I could load into it, we would put onto it a couple times a day. And it was really the first uh, way around the monopoly that the White House press corps had information from the from the uh, so of course I didn't really invent the internet but I did put in my plug to, uh, to well you found a way to 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 use it and I'll just say uh, Gail gives you permission she says leverage away let's make curiosity a promoted skill oh I love it so you took what was a, a um, just a tool right the, the, this these this dial up modem and the connection. That was a tool, but you found a way to actually make it beneficial to use it for for good. That's right. We opened it up. It was a key step in terms of transparency in the federal government. Now, of course, I talk to it, my children roll their eyes and they say, Mom, that was the last century. And then it occurred to them that it was the last millennium, which they thought was even <laughs> funnier. <laughs> it, it is. It's... Um... We live in a we live in an interesting time. Actually, I think this is still the absolutely the best time ever to be alive. Because I agree of, with you. There, there, there's so many opportunities. Look, here we are broadcasting uh, oh. out on Amazon, some other channels. Uh, Gail's looking and watching in from uh, LinkedIn. I mean, this is this is amazing. Gail's up in Canada. Uh, you're in Dallas, and uh, I'm here in Oregon. And we're all just having a conversation as we're sitting in this, as if we're sitting in the same room. So it's just wonderful.
And um, there, you wrote a couple of other books, of course. Um, we've got uh, Baby Bear. This is a, the recent children's book. And as I, as I go through, uh, you had written, oh, we're going to get to Grimm's ghost stories and how you were a, uh, an honored guest at Comic-Con with people getting your autograph and, um, and selfies and all that kind of stuff. So I want to get to that. Um, but you, you wrote this book, You Don't Say So. And uh, uh, volumes one and two of Marketplace Communication, Words Matter. So let's talk a little bit about some of these, uh, some of these books. Well, the business books, when I got out of the White House, I started this company and we had an experience on our first day with our first prospective client, which was the company that used to be Southwestern Bell Telephone. And they were one of the first companies to encourage their own employees to be ambassadors. And the CEO sat me down and he said, you know what we've learned? The customer does not remember what we thought we told them. And I thought, how have I missed this? But I realized that my whole approach had been to think about what I wanted to say or what I thought somebody needed to know. And the minute I ask how much do people remember from what you say, a lot or a little, everybody knows it's just a little. So I left that meeting thinking, I wonder if anybody studied that. We picked mm -hmm. up some clients right away. And so we designed a, uh, a strategic planning model called the influence model, which aims to teach people how to use communication to influence what people hear, what they believe and what they remember. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I had actually stumbled on before I left Washington, this is gonna come as a shocker, was that people remember negative things as opposed to positive things. Sure. So in our vocabulary, Scott, we say bad words crowd out good words. Mm. And um, I started writing on that. And as you can see, I've written a lot on it. Um, and again, these books are full of bite-sized essays. I guess you could sort of call them blog posts these days. But mm -hmm. the goal is to use real life examples in a way that's interesting and funny. And one of the things that we're known for is we give out these monthly awards called the Bimbo Awards. And that's because we discovered very early on that if you repeat and deny a negative, your listener hears the opposite of what the speaker's trying to say. Oh my gosh. And in the 90s, um, there was a young woman who shall go nameless, who was caught with a high profile, but alas, married man. And she held a press conference and she announced, I am not a bimbo. And so there were headlines all across the country about, I am not a bimbo. <laughs> so we recognize the, uh, every month we give uh, the, the, the three best bimbo of the month awards. And then we actually publish it behind those, all the things that I've developed over the month that are really lessons. And so the goal is to learn about how to use communication effectively, but to make it fun and funny. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so I will say then that Richard Nixon should no, have no, 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 my late husband wrote that speech. Yeah. <clears throat> so the, I am not a crook line. We would yeah. like to eliminate. Yes. Let's replace it with, I did not have sex with that woman and update it. <laughs> Mike Tyson's Mike, Mike Tyson's one of our favorite. He says, you called me a recluse rapist. I'm not a recluse. Oh my gosh. <coughs> so, so your husband wrote Nixon, Nixon's speech. Well, he, he didn't write that remark. Um, but yes, he was a speechwriter for Richard Nixon and then went on to become a distinguished lawyer. Oh my gosh. Uh, because nobody remembers the speech. The speech is long gone, but everybody remembers the crack. I mean, mm. and, and, and it will live forever, but we would like to replace it and update it. Uh, I got it. I got it. Let's see. So we've got uh, Jennifer Glass, uh, who is a brilliant marketer, by the way. And uh, she's uh, uh, talking to uh, using our channel here and, and uh, mentioning Gail. The saying likewise about about politics, being fascinated by politics. So that's uh, Gail, uh, fascinated by politics, loves this conversation. And uh, Jennifer's the same thing. And let's see. Keep repeating a lie. And people remember that too. That may be true. Well, you know, there's that old saying that a, uh, a lie gets halfway around the world before the truth gets out of its chair. And there's a lot of truth to that with today with particularly social media. Mm -hmm. um, 
but I'm still, I remain optimistic, Scott. I'm a glass half full person, um, perhaps because I've had so many opportunities and people have treated me so well that I feel it's incumbent on me to try and take that attitude uh, of gratitude and also to look for things that I can do to give back. Mm -hmm. You know, I love that. I, uh, Gail, just speaking of Gail, I, I often introduce Gail uh, Robertson as saying, some people say the glass is, is half full. Some people say the glass is half empty. Uh, but when you meet Gail, she says, can I top that off for you? So, oh, she, well, what a, what a, good, oh, I'm giving all kinds of tips from this. Thank she's you. A good, good person. Thank you, Gail. Yeah, Gail. And Jennifer, great to have you here, too. She, uh, like I said, she is a great marketing brain. So, uh, I just uh, I was thinking back. Uh, so, you're so Ronald Reagan was the president, you're there, and uh, Howard Baker was chief of staff. Jim Baker. Oh, excuse me, Jim Baker. So, oh, get the right you, Baker. You were close, right? Yeah, uh, I was close. Mr. Baker was chief of staff, and um, Ronald Reagan, by the way, was the uh, the first person that I ever voted for for president. For the United yes, States. thank you. Thank when you. I was, uh, I had just turned eighteen, and it was my first uh, opportunity to vote, and uh, that was uh, a number of years ago as well. Um, but uh, so, you met Ronald Reagan. I met Ronald Reagan. Um, and it would be something of a stretch to say I work with Ronald Reagan, but I did on a couple of occasions. And what was your experience? Oh, well, when I met with him and, and Scott, the president did not lean over to me and say, hey, Mary, what do you think about the Stark Treaty? <laughs> um, but I did sure. brief him. We did a couple of groundbreaking uh, uh, briefings at the White House. We had the first briefing for editors of women's magazines. Mm -hmm. And the president was one of my speakers. And very frequently, he would come and do what we call a drop by. That means he'd come and he would say hello and welcome the guests, whoever we were doing the briefing for that morning or that afternoon. Um, and he was one. He was a great listener, as you and I were just talking, since you are a motivational listener. President Reagan would have loved that line, and he would have considered mm. himself that. Um, he, and he had, of course, a well-developed, famous sense of, uh, of humor. What I like to tell people is he had the self-confidence to allow people to underestimate a mm. writer, a, a terrific Alice uh, uh, understand. He was just a let's see. I think Scott, are you we still the, there? I'm yeah. just getting used to this new media. <laughs> Sometimes the uh, internet uh, slows things down, so. Uh, but we're still here. We're still live. Everything is good. And um, I'm just looking at uh, uh, at uh, some comments on Amazon. So Liz Lawless is there uh, watching. So uh, she asks, and this is a great this is a great moment here because we're, we're going to put this slide up and let's go again. You've written a number of books. Great resume. Um, uh, Baby Bear comes back. Liz says. Why did you, with all of this background, all this experience, why did you choose to write a children's book? Well, um, I continue to write <clears throat> and speak, and I have a very well-developed, I think, business persona, and I've been blessed for be in business for 35 years. But I also have grandchildren, <clears throat> and um, my grandchildren are uh, extremely well-equipped, and my, my, uh, my son and his wife <clears throat> are great parents, and they are also trying to raise children who are very appreciative of the possessions that they have. And so uh, I had to do something that, that was intangible. And I thought, what's the best thing I could give her? I could give her stories. And Baby Bear Comes Back mm -hmm. is a story. Of, it is about a, a bear whom you see on the cover, which is pretty much how he looks today. In other words, the truth is Baby Bear has seen better days. Notice he's Oh, the truth is, Scott, he's missing some of his fur. His nose is long gone. <clears throat> but he was my son's bear from birth. And then as my son grew up, uh, things went into boxes, including baby bear. And then some 25 years later, my son and his wife had a little girl. Her name is Martha. And baby bear came out of his box. And Martha adopted him um, pretty much also from birth. And Baby Bear is now her constant companion. So he has a new lease on life. 
Um, and you know, for a stuffed animal, the, the greatest privilege is to be a child's beloved companion. And so this is a story about how Baby Bear came back. Uh, and it's a story about love. It's also, I've written it with a couple of things that I hope will be of use to parents. First of all, it's got some words in it that you, if you are reading through it, you can skip over or you can say to the child, what does this mean? So that mm -hmm. there's a vocabulary component of it. It also deals very briefly with some difficult topics, but that's part of life. <clears throat> and so it's a story that the child can read by him or herself or a parent or an adult can read to a child so that it can be interactive as well. And it also suggests some things to, to work about, to, to work on with the child so that it's interactive. <clears throat> at one point, the, the, there's a story about Philip, my son, being at a wedding, and it, he, um, uh, he starts yelling in the middle of the ceremony. So the parent who's reading the book says, have you ever felt like doing that? How loud can you yell? So it's got interactive things so that it's got different levels that you can read it at. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's interesting since I published it, the number of people who have well-worn loveys is absolutely incredible. <laughs> I love it. I just, um, I was just uh, thinking about this is a, it's a great, this is a great gift, right? So if you, I'll just tell people, uh, if you have children, if you know someone who has children, if you are once a child, uh, pick up a copy of Baby Bear Comes Back and Amazon makes it really easy uh, to send it to somebody. So if you know somebody that's next door or across the street, uh, across the continent somewhere, you can put their address in and send it right to them. So you can just click, uh, click. it's in the carousel, click on it in the bottom and it'll open up a new tab, uh, put add to cart, put a person's address in there, be the hero and, um, and hey, Scott, give them a copy of this book. Can I share with you something I'm working on Please. right now? <clears throat> well, one of the things uh, we went to the Texas Library Association meeting last week, at uh, last uh, spring, and one of the things that was critical to me is it really underscored the importance of getting children to read. <clears throat> and one of the ways to do that is to get them to read aloud. Mm. And uh, one of the things that mercifully we have not talked about is that I also write poetry. <clears throat> and uh, years and years and years ago, I won a poetry award in New York. So this time I decided to write poetry for young children to read aloud. So to think of this as Dr. Stu Dr. Seuss 2.0. And I've got a, we're just about to launch a setup where you can sign up and get a poem free a week to read to your children. And I've got, do I have time to read one? Uh, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. If you have one, do yeah. it. The first batch are all about animals. There was a bee, there was a moth, there was a squirrel. This one's called, so there, there's, there's, there are three months of these that you can sign up for. And again, they're free. There was a zebra whose stripes were blurred. Everyone thought it looked absurd. To explain, he couldn't use words, not only his stripes, but his speech was slurred. But he was lucky and moved to a zoo. The animals loved it, and wouldn't you? Lots to eat and lots to do, and somebody else cleans up all your poo. He'd run around through muck and mire, but then he started to perspire. He'd look in a mirror and would admire the result of a bath, and then he'd retire. So <laughs> they're very short, but they're designed for children to read aloud. And mm -hmm. again, they come with instructions about how to look for words in the middle of the lines, because what I want to do is get children to love to read. And mm -hmm. one of the things that's clear is if you can get them to read aloud and to enjoy, it has an admittedly sing-song quality, but if you can get them to read aloud. So I'm, I'm experimenting with this. And if people would like to sign up, we're going to launch this new thing. It's a poem a week, again, and the goal is to make it free. Wonderful. And um, Liz Lawless puts a comment in there. It's, it's uh, uh, authormaryspath.com, and that's uh, just like it shows on the screen, M E R R I E spathe.com, author Mary spathe.com. That's where people can sign up to get the poem. Yes, that's what it's delivered to them. Yes, it's perfect. Yeah, I love to get people to sign up for that. Uh, reading is, is uh, such a, a key fundamental, and there's so much research that shows how it helps develop children's brains. Absolutely, <clears throat> and you can start to read to children. Uh, when they are very young, um, and um, it sort of breaks my heart to know how many families don't buy any books during a year because 
uh, one of the things, Scott, is our libraries do such a good job. Um, and there's so many programs for children. Mm -hmm. And if you can get kids interested in reading, the um, one of the things when we went to the um, uh, Library Association last spring, and then as you know, I was at Comic-Con over the, over the summer, <clears throat> is that gaming has really taken over. It's taken over books. It's mm -hmm. taken over Comic-Con. And I'm not opposed to gaming, but I'm very pro reading. Right. And that's a good segue for the moment. Let me just uh, let me just uh, put this one up. Grimm's Ghost uh, Stories. My past comes back to haunt me. <laughs> uh, Episode uh, number ten, January first, nineteen seventy three, and uh, um, ha so where does this fall in with you being in the White House, uh, producing <laughs> for twenty twenty? Um, being in movies with Peter Sellers and Angela Lansbury. How did you get to be able to write for a comic book? Well, I was, um, I had got, I had started writing in college and I'd gotten a job at the Philadelphia Inquirer as a young reporter. And then I had moved to New York because I wanted to be a serious writer. And I actually got some assignments right away. So I had assignments, but no money. <clears throat> so I was rooming with a friend of mine one afternoon and in New York City, the air conditioning went out. Up comes the superintendent and I'm working away and he says to me, are you a writer? And I said, um, yeah, yes, y yes, I, I am a writer. And he said, I illustrate the Smokey the Bear comic books. Would you ever be interested in writing comic books? I said, yes. So he gave me, so down I went to Gold Key met the people there and they said, can you write horror comics? I said, of course I can write horror comic books. That's practically my middle name and so they assigned me uh dark shadows grim's ghost stories ripley's believe it or not uh, every once in a while i would pick up a um uh, something a little bit longer it paid 10 bucks a page and i had my monthly expenses figured out in comic book pages <laughs> <laughs> and, and i did it for two years it supported me i'm actually a little embarrassed now because um the truth is scott i really didn't take it seriously i would think about these ideas, which are truly, in many cases, bizarre and wild. Mm -hmm. And I'd trot down to Gold Key and I'd show them to Wally Green, who was the editor, and he'd approve the ones he wanted. And I'd go back and I'd write the story, the dialogue, and the description of the artwork. And I'd trundle back down and pick up my check. <clears throat> um, mercifully, I have about a dozen that I saved. Um, and the rest of them, of course, are you know long gone and lost to history. But that's mm -hmm. actually... Um, sort of what brought me to Comic-Con is because the Henry Orient people and, and comic book people, I guess in their own ways, they're just all, you know, very unusual types of people. They overlap. And a couple of years ago, people said, I understand that Mary Spaeth wrote Superman comics, which I did not. Mm -hmm. and so they called me and they said, we can't believe you're still alive. <laughs> this was half a century ago. But apparently... There aren't that many people around. There are very few women who wrote comic books half a century ago. And sure. the ones that did tended to write romance comic books. Mm -hmm. So without meaning to, I had carved out this little niche by myself. And then, of course, COVID hit and, and the pandemic and things got shut down. But then they came back and they said, are you still alive? Okay. Do you want to come to Comic-Con? It was a great experience. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I had a, with the exception of looking at how gaming has taken over, I mm -hmm. had a wonderful time. It is just a a tsunami of creativity and fun, and everybody's dressed up. Yeah. Are you planning on going back? I am. Oh, wonderful. I told Liz, uh, who is the publisher, I said everybody should go to Comic-Con and experience it once. Yeah. Well, I think uh, we'll have more people there just to come and get uh, selfies with you and have you autograph, uh, get your autograph. So I was just, you were talking about saying that, uh, you know, there weren't that many uh, women writers of comic books. And even, I, I was just thinking of Star Trek, and there was a, a, a woman who wrote for Gene Roddenberry's Star Trek back in the mid-60s, uh, D.C. Fontana. But she went by D.C. Fontana so that people wouldn't know that she was a woman, that it was just a name, because there was some... Uh, Probably prejudice, I'll just say. It was prejudice. I think that's putting it mildly. <clears throat> yeah. But, it, you know, it's interesting, though, because talent 
will come to the talent will out one way or another. Not that I was terribly talented, but I was certainly persistent. Mm -hmm. And as I said, I had a, uh, a febrile imagination. Well, so writing, uh, so we've got this, this, this great variety. Uh, so the children's book, which is great. I love that, that, um, we have something that, this legacy is founded on uh, so much personal experience uh, for the kids. You've got took your business experience, your White House experience, uh, and put that into some business books. And um, when somebody asked you, and this is, a, I'll just say, this is an important thing for people to remember when they, uh, when you want to be something, if you want to be a writer and people, and you do some writing, and when people ask you, what do you do? And you tell them, I'm a writer then that, that's the first step to, to fulfilling it. So you are just a wonderful example and I hope an encouragement to people. Uh, and I just, I'm putting this back up because um, we have right at the top, but just uh, this uh, producer for 2020 and one of, the, one of the stories that you did there was on Liberace. I did. <clears throat> um, I had done a documentary for WOR television in New York on gifted children. And that brought me to the attention of 2020. And I basically repeated it and did the same documentary at a much higher level. And I got additional assignments. And however, uh, about half a year into that, Av Weston and Rune Arledge, the legendary directors of ABC News came in, they sat down and they said, Mary, you're getting a reputation as a thoughtful producer. That's not good, not good. Thoughtful is not a good word. And that means basically you think of your, that you're educational, not good. So I had to redeem mm -hmm. myself. And I was on an airplane next to Seymour Heller, and he was he was Liberace's manager, and he was a Henry Orient fan. Okay. So I said, "Why has Liberace never cooperated with one of the news shows?" And he said, "Well, you know, he's never really found the right fit." Um, and I said, "Well, would he be willing to work with me?" And he said, "Yes." So I went back to 2020, and I said, "I've got Liberace," and of course, the more senior producer said, "You can't have Liberace. We deserve." And I said. He said he'd work with me. Um, and so we went out with a full crew. We did a week of filming in, uh, in Las Vegas. And it mm -hmm. is, it, Liberace was wonderful to work with Scott. He was so professional. We filmed him. But I also learned the value of repetition. And he had, you know, those people were familiar with him. Every number he'd have a more and more flamboyant costume. Mm -hmm. And then in the end, he came out in the black tux. And he'd, he'd come up to the edge and he said, you like my costume? It's my most expensive costume. It's the buttons. They're real diamonds, and they spell out my name. L-I-B-E-R. And then he'd turn around and show it through, and then he'd say, C-E. And he'd look over his shoulder, and he'd say, are you looking at the buttons? Well, we filmed four shows, and we had a terrible time because about 80% of the audience were repeats. And, you know, mm -hmm. he built up this. So, and they knew all the lines. Mm -hmm. So before he could turn around and say, are you looking at the buttons? He'd turn around and they'd go, are you looking at the buttons? <laughs> so they were always a step ahead of him. But anyway, oh, we did do, it, it's, it's, a, it's a great document. Again, it's one of those things. I had a fantastic cameraman. I had a fantastic crew. The editor, Ruth Iwana, was a legend. So mm -hmm. I had, I mean, my name was on it. But all the people who were supporting me, who, who really knew what they were doing, they really deserve the credit because they made it a great piece. The, amazing. So uh, you asked if you could work with Liberace when knowing that other people had, had, had said no. You were willing to take that risk to say, to ask. Of course, what could he say but no? Yeah. I suppose the worst thing that could happen is he said yes, because yeah. then you have work to do. But the other thing, Scott, I think that um, Seymour Heller and Liberace knew, I really thought he was great. And there are too many people, you know, who looked down on him and thought he was you know, either just an entertainer or too, I mean, I thought he was marvelous. Mm -hmm. And I think they could tell that. So that's one of the reasons that they let me work with him. And he was marvelous. So, um, I'm just thinking, you know, we're going back and I'm just, I was just, uh, I was just looking at these, uh, 
so we got the ghost stories we got the business book we got this uh so I'll go back to the to the movie where, where i have the movie here uh the world of henry orient so this is when you were in eighth grade and um had the opportunity to do this had a lifelong friendship with angela lansbury and then it, it led to you while you were sitting on the plane being able to to uh to oh say we'll go back to leverage this experience and that kind of helped get you into the into into this whole 2020 and and um yeah, yeah. experience Henry, of Mirachi. Yeah. Henry Orient is an undiscovered gem, or aren't you maybe I should say Scott, it's a partially discovered gem. Mm -hmm. It is not only was it a great script, but George Roy Hill, you know, who did The Sting and Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid was a great director. The cast, as I said, Angela Lansbury, Peter Sellers, Tom Bosley, Peter Duchin, a great cast. And it is a charming story about these two girls who grow up. <clears throat> it's also a Turner Classic movie. And for the 50th anniversary, uh, Turner Classic Movies invited me out to the West Coast for the celebration. Uh, Oklahoma was the number one movie and Henry Marriott was the second movie. Wow. And, and I did, I did the, you know, the red carpet walk. And I, cause I said, are you sure this is 50 years ago that anybody is going <laughs> to remember it? And they said, Oh, Oh yes, Mary, you, you got to do it. You got to do it. So I get down and there's, if you've ever done these things, there's a bleacher at the end where they're, which is packed full of a couple hundred fans. And I get to the end and they knew all the dialogue. So I get to the end and I said, you know, Hello. And they said, Mary, do the cigarette bit where the girls have collected a cigarette button and they look at it and they open it up and they say, no filter. He's not scared. So they want to, you know, they, they, they knew all the dialogue. It was wonderful. Um, I mean, you have to be moved by that if you go through it yourself, but I promise your audience that anybody who looks at it will love it. It is a charming movie. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And uh, unfortunately, we're not able to stream it, but we can get the, the, the DVD and play that. And uh, so that's that's another great item. I've got it highlighted in the carousel. And uh, I love uh, Jennifer Glass's comment. If you don't ask, you cannot get. Jennifer, thank you. You are so right. I've got another item here that we're going to put up that's related There we go. Baby Bear Comes Back, a coloring book. That's right. <clears throat> the uh, One of the things when I was at the Texas Library Conference last year that was clear was that the more ways you can engage children, the more they're liable to read. So I, my children and my grandchildren loved coloring books. Mm -hmm. And so we did a coloring book version of Baby Bear Comes Back. There's also a comic book version of it as well. Um, but the idea is to engage children in all kinds of different things. <clears throat> I mean, as you can see, uh, Scott, I will stoop to anything. I will leave no stone unturned to try and involve children in, uh, in reading and creativity. I love it. Um, so that's why there's a coloring book. <clears throat> mm -hmm. And also children who start coloring it, you know, like at three or four, are then very likely to want to read a book that has longer pages in it and they can match up some of the illustrations. So that's why mm -hmm. we have the coloring book. Mm -hmm. And the comic book is a natural, but I'm thinking the story of Baby Bear Comes Back, the coloring book, or the comic book, is not the same stories as, the, as what you wrote for uh, Gold Key. Well, different stories. I, I, they're different stories. I learned though the, 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 uh, the comic book tries to have, if you'll pardon the word, a little edgy twist. Mm -hmm. And it's about a, a um, revolt of the, of the denizens of the bedroom, uh, which then they finally end up becoming friends. But I was, I was I'm trying to experiment with what will get kids to read. So maybe can baby bear come back a tale of jealousy, envy, and finally friendship. And it has a really nasty computer who tries to take over the bedroom. That's a great illustration of what people think AI is today. Right. So this is very topical. I love that. Oh, please. In my business, one of the key issues that all of our clients are dealing with is AI and chat GPT. Mm -hmm. And I am actually, I guess I shouldn't say this, Scott. I am actually very scared. I mean, there are now a couple of cases, some of them very high profile, 
where lawyers have submitted briefs to, to, to you know, courts. Mm-hmm. And it turns out that ChatGPT invented all the citations. I, I heard the same thing, and I was appalled that uh, an attorney wouldn't uh, check it, wouldn't fact check it. Well, you know, the it should first, be easy to do. Well, the first one of those that turned up last summer, company A sued company B. Company uh, B successfully fended off company A, which then appealed. And that was when they turned up, they come back, they go back and say, you know, these citations that you have, we can't find where those cases are. Well, that's because they didn't exist. Okay. <laughs> but they fooled both sets of lawyers. They fooled the judge. Oh. If it hadn't gone up to a, to uh, to the appellate court, people wouldn't have known. So yeah. Oh, my word. I mean, if you live in the world that I live in, that really makes you stop and think, yeah. where are we headed? And do we have any control over this? And the answer probably is, not much. Well, and this goes back to your whole uh, focus on the on the children and getting them to read. And I will say, what goes along with reading is critical thinking, and 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 that's really a big that's a big skill that we need more than ever with uh, all of this. Because as I said, should does this sound? As they say, if it sounds too good to be true, or then take a look. So when I was at the Federal Trade Commission, one of the things that they regulate is advertising. And our chairman, James Miller, used to say the same thing. He said, you know, the first consumers need to think they need to protect themselves. And the first thing they need to ask is if a deal seems too good to be true. It probably is. Yeah. So uh, as we start to wind down, Mary, I just first of all, it's been so much fun. I just want to say, well, thank you. I have just enjoyed uh, spending time talking with you and just getting a little glimpse into your fascinating background, all of these different uh, great things that you've done. I'll put this back up. Um, Everything from uh, 2020 with Liberace, uh, White House Fellows Program, uh, Federal Care Commission, Director of Media Relations at the White House, uh, I just got actor, author, entrepreneur, uh, children's book writer, and uh, I am—I believe that I'm going to see you face to face live at the uh, Texas Library Association the spring, right? Coming up in April, yeah. We'll yeah. be there together. Yeah, the library conference really is a wonderful place to go. You'll love it, Scott. And there are tons of small publishers and. Uh, listening to them and what their insights are is really it's, mm-hmm. it's fascinating. So one of the things that that uh, I'm hoping that we can do, if we have a good internet connection, let's do another live broadcast and we can go oh, right into yes. Amazon. But we can do it from the floor there. We can bring yourself in, some of your other authors, and we can talk about maybe some of the other books that you're working on. Because I know you're not idle. Uh, can you give us a little glimpse? And I'm going to tell people uh, when you go to uh, when you go onto the page, uh, and let me just put uh, this back this back back up here. Um, oops, let me put the right put this on the stage. Here we go. Uh, people can click right here and go to your name and go to your author page, and then they can click right here, follow. And if they do that then they're going to get notified when you publish another book on Amazon. So what are you working on now? Well, just between the two of us, Scott, um, we have a black Labrador whose name is Gypsy. Mm -hmm. And Gypsy has a tail that has a tail of its own. Oh, okay. Um, I've also been baby bear uh, turned out to have quite a personality and he's got a commentary on everything. I'm not quite ready to share it with everything because sometimes, well, Scott, he can be somewhat naughty in his commentary. So, <laughs> okay, all right. Well, it makes it interesting for the parents. So, well, you know, the animals see all. It is true. It is true. Uh, I had a. You have baby bear. Let me put baby bear back up on the on the screen here, and. Um, I had a, a stuffed bear look very similar to baby bear here. 
that uh, traveled all over the place with me as I went uh, to Europe and uh, across the United States. And it was my daughter's bear and, and she gave it to me to uh, take. And so I would take pictures of, of that little bear as we uh, as I was in different places and it gave us a, a way to connect. And I just, I see that with baby bear here. And I think a lot of people that are watching today and watching in the replay are going to be able to connect with baby bear. Yes, unfortunately, he does never get his nose back, but um, <laughs> part of the part of the uh, charm. Yeah, anyway, Scott, this has been so much fun. How do I say thank you enough? Oh, well, we'll be able to see each other live and tell more stories, and uh, we'll record that and share it with people because that is fabulous. And um, so we're going to have fun. So thank you to to uh, Jennifer and to Gail who are commenting here and sharing and I know other people are watching and to Liz Lawless, thank you for all of the, the comments and stuff. And, and I'll just say, Mary, what a pleasure to spend time with you. And, and I can't say the same, I can say the same thing, Scott. It's been delightful. You are a wonderful conversationalist, which is becoming okay. a lost art. So thank you. And you are gonna make me into a motivational listener as well. <laughs> We all help each other along the way. As we say, we're all in this together. Well, I'm going to put this up and we'll sign off. Hang on here and uh, we'll talk to you in just a moment. And I'm just going to put this up so everyone can see. There's Mary Spath. Look, we've got uh, books, movies. We've got uh, comic books. All this stuff is in the carousel. Share this out with your friends, but click Add to Cart. Uh, send Baby Bear to a friend, to somebody who you know who has children or was once a child and needs to be lifted up. Uh, so thank you for everyone who's watched us here on Amazon. And I just wish you the best and have a fabulous day. Cheers.